and welcome back to Sex, Brains, and Money. I'm your host, Nikki Thomas, at the Autism Art Auction. <laughs> the audience just keeps on growing. Let's keep up the momentum. So, and now we go to our third brainiac of the day. This is Leonardo Ferraro, who you may remember from two previous episodes of Sex, Brains, and Money. As you can tell, I have tapped into all of the brain trust that we have uh, brought forth in previous episodes, and Leo has agreed to join us once again today. Thank you for being here, Leo. Always a pleasure. I, I know it's always a pleasure. That's why you keep coming back. <laughs> so we're still talking about autism, and you had some things to say about social contexts of autism and how we approach it as a society. Can you give us some more details? Absolutely. Um, well, I, I was... Uh, I'm coming to this, I guess, more from my background as a teacher, mm -hmm. really, having taught and having taught a number of kids with uh, on the spectrum and with Aspergers and such. Um, and it's it's interesting because we're talking about a disorder, especially in the high functioning range, that manifests primarily socially. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, as has been discussed before, uh, you have uh, people who have. Um, normal or even exceptional ability in a number of areas, but this is one crucial place where, where they have some difficulty, right? Uh, and that's in the social arena. And, and that's sort of exactly the wrong place to have a problem, right? If you, if you stink at math or if you, you know, you're having trouble reading, it's problematic, but people don't judge you nearly as harshly, all right? Uh, if you're not so good at reading body language or facial expressions, uh, you get labeled really quickly, and next thing you know, uh, these things tend to feed on themselves and compound. Um, speaking as a teacher, I have to say it was challenging the very first time uh, I taught a kid with Asperger's, precisely because of this. And what, what exactly was that like? Can you elaborate a little bit more? Well, it's, 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 um, <laughs> it's a little shocking sometimes, <laughs> actually, uh, being, you know, you're bald. Yes, yes, yes I am. Stating uh, the obvious, right? <laughs> Uh, and not always the pleasantly obvious, right? <laughs> uh, it took a while for me to own this, but uh, um, what's, what, what, what you end up having to do, and, and I found actually, once I learned this lesson in, in a clinical context, I found it actually bearing fruit outside of that. If you're willing to undertake a certain amount of additional social burden, all right, you get a lot of value from these interactions. Like I said, you're talking about people who, who do have a lot to offer. They have one specific area of, of difficulty. And if you're, if you're willing to help compensate for that, so I'm talking outside of, of, of the concept of treatment. All mm -hmm. right? I'm talking about how we deal with people and how we interact with people and talking about a more inclusive notion of tolerance here. Um, if you're willing to undertake a little more of the social burden, all right, that person is free to be who they are, and, and, and a lot happens. I've met people who were maybe not technically on the spectrum, who maybe had difficulty with that, and the conversation and the value from, from those interactions grows when, when you recognize that additional dimension and allow that people have different abilities at it. Okay, mm -hmm. so when you, you, you have to meet them a little more than halfway in terms of being Absolutely. more direct about what you mean and not expecting them to pick up on nuance. Absolutely. Being a little bit more um, specific with what you expect of them instead of just guessing that they're going to read your body language. For sure. Even just creating a space where they're not being judged, where mm -hmm. you just let stuff roll off, you, 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 I guess the communication becomes a little more direct in that regard, all right? So, um, well, let me give you uh, an example. I was reading about this in preparation for, for mm -hmm. today. Um, a place where you find uh, people with, who fit on this part of the spectrum with what, what is going to formally be known as Asperger's. <laughs> Um, is in the IT mm -hmm. field, yes. all right? Apparently Silicon Valley saw a huge, huge increase in kids who were being diagnosed on the ASD spectrum. And Absolutely. Uh, they even wrote an article in Wired called The Geek Syndrome, where they were talking about how so many parents in Silicon Valley seem to show some of these uh, typical behaviors, which then appeared in their kids as well. Well, a lot of the features that you see that are characteristic of, of autism, in particular high-functioning autism and, and Asperger's, uh, are really conducive to, to these sorts of disciplines and fields. Uh, this poor guy um, was having difficulty uh, holding in a job and, and when, you, when you looked at this case in particular it was shocking because his technical skills were, were, were almost peerless. All right? Where the problem came is, is so many of his evaluations, so many of his work evaluations were based on social criteria mm -hmm. rather than competence at his job. And what he said is like, look, 
man, I can't make your users happy. What I can do is I can maximize your uptime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cared a lot more about the servers being up than the well, coworkers being right. Well, exactly. And, and, you know, I mean, that's, that's not his failing, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's like, that's a poor understanding in the culture of how to, how to manage this. In fact, like I said, the, the, the statistics show, uh, at least this person in particular, his, his job performance stats, is that he was fantastic at his job, mm -hmm. all right? When he was manning things, like I said, they had um, almost flawlessly uninterrupted service. Um, that's, a, a, I guess, a, a, a concrete example of where adjusting our perception of this is more relevant than, say, trying to either label, pathologize, or treat someone. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, instead of instead of trying to 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 change the person, right? We can change ourselves a little bit, or at least our approach to how we deal with it. And our expectations, of course. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, you know what? That's really enlightening, and I do hope that we get to a point where um, you know people are not expected to necessarily be best friends with everybody as long as they're getting their jobs done and from the sound of it uh, people are getting more and more educated about the different skill set that different people have and the ability to specialize and things along those lines. Do you have any suggestions for potential employers who might be looking at uh, hiring somebody on the <laughs> ASD spectrum or something along those lines? I think that you should be clear as to what you want all right. Obviously, there's some jobs where social interface is crucial. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, and you that's wouldn't hire a, someone to be, you know, a car, car salesperson or something like that. Right. Probably. You want, you know, but there's places where maybe that's a luxury. Mm -hmm. It's a frill that's not necessary. Right. And and at that point, I guess be clear as to what metrics are appropriate when evaluating evaluating a candidate. All right. If you need someone who lives in the server cave, <laughs> and who does that, that's fine. Right. Who who cares if they're a, a, a charming lunch companion? You know, um, I guess you would change the, your, your interview style from a more conversational one to maybe a problem-based one, mm -hmm. all right? Do those really cool, silly questions like, why are manhole covers round and stuff? And <laughs> <laughs> which is a requirement from, um, was it Microsoft or IBM? I can't remember which company uh, said that they have to be. And that's because the, a, square round, a square manhole cover could fall through. A round manhole cover never can. There's, there's a number of good answers to that. The other one is that it's actually easier to move round manholes. You can roll them, uh, right? Okay. You don't have to lug them around. Uh, because I think triangular manhole covers also set to the criteria of not falling down the shaft. <laughs> well, either way, if that's, a, if that's your focus and if you're an employer who's looking for somebody with a very specific skill set, then maybe downplay the social aspects and you'll find yourself with a very good employee. So. If, if I could leave you with one more thought, is mm -hmm. we, it also, it, it doesn't hurt to maybe change or modify what we expect from a social encounter mm. and, and maybe put less emphasis on, on, on superficial pleasantness and, and in fact maybe consider that interactions can have uh, a more rewarding level of depth if we perhaps aren't as consumed with the surface level there. You know, speaking as someone who trades heavily on bad jokes, I suppose I'd be handicapping myself. But you know, it's it, there's more to it than that. There's more to to a good social encounter than 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 that sort of superficial charm. Definitely. Well, you know what? Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you so much for bringing all that information to us today. And thank you for joining us again on Sex, Brains, and Money. Always a pleasure, like I said. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take a brief break and show you some more of the artwork that we have highlighted for our auction today, and then we will come back with yet another guest who's going to talk about her experiences working with people with different abilities. Stay tuned.